my career was largely uh, initially in the, working in the tax area, but then he evolved over the years uh, into the corporate and tax area. Okay. But um, it was, uh, it was, uh, I think, uh, the, the, really the time that I remember with the, the greatest fondness was probably the first 10 years or so. Uh, it was the time of uh, growth and development for me. Mm -hmm. uh, I had the opportunity to be mentored by two of the best. Yeah. Uh, there are Jim Gamble and Brian Sullivan. Mm -hmm. In my final year uh, in, in undergraduate, I... Uh, this was at MSU? MSU, okay. Michigan State. Yep. Um, I um, took a class in business law and I loved it, absolutely loved it. Ace the class and I figured, wow, this is really exciting. Yeah. And I mean, it was in my final semester and I'm still, at that point I was, uh, I was uh, planning to uh, become a naval uh, aviator to my ambition was to fly jet planes. Wow. <laughs> uh, so you've always been seeking uh, maybe, a thrill. <laughs> maybe, maybe that was uh, an early sign of that. Sign, yeah. And then as it turned out at the very last minute, it turned out that I was too tall. Oh. Uh, at that time, okay. I was too tall. I was six three and a half, and uh, I'm no longer six three and a half. <laughs> And, um, so you, that's your retirement job then, right? right yeah. <laughs> so uh, I, uh, they wouldn't let me into the program uh, to learn to uh, be a naval jet fighter pilot. So I made a quick change to uh, go to law school. So, you know, the combination of the staff support, the attorneys, the clients you get to work with, you're very much a part of, uh, of uh, the circumstances of, of your clients. Mm -hmm. You know everything about them, their ambitions, their problems, their insecurities, mm -hmm. their weaknesses, and you're all, you're, you're very much a part of, of making them, uh, making the client uh, uh, achieve their goals. Clients became good friends, uh, good friends, and uh, people you, even to this day, some of my best friends today. After six weeks of climbing, we finally were ready to push for the summit. We had a plan, planned very carefully, and uh, the plan largely centered around time time. We had planned an 18-hour push from our highest camp at 26,000 feet to the summit and back. And we planned in that for 18 hours. We had timetable and we had a turnaround time. Um, and at uh, on the final ridge uh, leading to the top, uh, that's when the mistakes were made. And we lost a lot of time. And this is where the story changed. And this is where, uh, when I think about my career as a lawyer, mm -hmm. uh, came into play to some extent, mm -hmm. as well as my personal life, because for six weeks the challenge was primarily a, a physical challenge, uh, to physically climb six miles of rock, snow, and ice. But at that moment at noon, at the Hillary Step, um, the challenge changed from one that required physical strength to one that required inner strength. Because at that point, the challenge was to make a hard decision, a decision that was hard, a dilemma. The kind of things that I think my lawyering helped me here because, you know, in, in law and in practice, it, it's never black and white. It's always gray, and it's the dreaded dilemma that you have to be able to deal with. And I dealt with that for decades as a lawyer. 
how to deal with the dilemma. But there you are, the pressures of the moment. Uh, right. You're so close. You're at a distance, uh, vertical feet from about home plate to the center field fence, mm -hmm. to the top of the highest mountain in the world. And, uh, and world records were about to be set. You know, even myself, even myself, I made the, at first made the wrong decision uh, to continue to go under the pressures of the peer pressures to others were going, others were going, I'm going. And, you know, in mountain climbing, there's only one wor one thing worse than not reaching the summit, and that is when others do and you don't. Even if I could have gotten away with it, did I want to be mm -hmm. that person? Mm -hmm. Because to get away with it meant recklessness. Um, breaching your promises on the turnaround time, mm -hmm. endangering the lives of other people, mm -hmm. and also breaking my promise to my wife Sandy to mm -hmm. only live a story I could tell that would not be a story I could come home and tell. Mm -hmm. And this is why I, to this day, say that the Everest story is not a mountain climbing story. It's a story about everyday life because mm -hmm. all of us, each of us, face hard decisions mm -hmm. in life. And each of us, <clears throat> face our ambitions, we face uh, the struggles with all the pressures to succeed. Um, dealing with the aftermath wasn't all that easy and st still isn't to this day because um, even as I sit here, those bodies, my friends, they're still there. They're still there for eternity and I know right where they are. And I can just see them in my head. A very unsettling thing, uh, knowing that for eternity they're they're there. Mm -hmm. I suffered very minor damage. I had some frostbite on my fingers, mm -hmm. and uh, and on one toe, but it was uh, it was pretty bad. It was pretty minor. I did come back though with a bunch of bandages on my fingers. I always say whatever happened to me physically was inconsequential because uh, of the devastation that was left behind for you and other survivors. Uh, my tent mate lost both hands to frostbite. Another climber lost both hands and both feet to frostbite. Uh, disfigurement of the face from frostbite. So there's a lot of uh, uh, physical damage that was left behind. There was also uh, a lot of uh, intangible mental damage left behind. There are some people, even to this day, don't want to talk about it, don't want to hear about it, mm -hmm. never read anything about it. About the worst th I could say about it was the fact that I couldn't turn it off. Mm -hmm. uh, I couldn't turn it off at night, it would mm -hmm. replay. Not in a nightmarish kind of way or yeah. anything, but it was more of a, <clears throat> just couldn't turn, turn it yeah. off. But I was a consultant to the studio, so I had sort of the inside track on uh, what was happening. I can, not that I had a lot of influence uh, necessarily, because it was never intended to be a documentary that was chronicled uh, the factual record. Um, uh, but nevertheless, everything that is shown in the movie actually happened. There were no cheesy parts to juice it up for drama. They had good actors, the acting was good, music Did you get good. to meet um, Mark Derwin? He's, he played you, right? Mark Derwin, yes, played my, played my part, and we became actually good friends okay. uh, because of it. The story focuses almost exclusively on the people who died. Mm -hmm. So people who lived mm -hmm. had a small part, such as me. Um, but there was uh, elements of a love story, uh, elements of, uh, of stories of everyday life, of uh, marital problems and uh, uh, issues of depression. And I mean, things that brought out some of the real uh, qualities of the characters who were actually involved. They uh, had an interesting focus though. They did not want people walking out of the theater um, 
thinking and talking about human failure. Uh, but that is the story. It's a story of human failure. Um, <clears throat> they wanted people walking out of the theater talking about the storm as a villain and not human failure. So to that extent, the story has been skewed away from mm -hmm. the reality of what happened. I wrote it in 1997 and 1998, and I wrote it for some very specific reasons at the time. Uh, at the time, it was to both, well, it was to record a very different perspective of what went wrong, mm -hmm. um, but it was also to deal with what I thought of as a journey to understand my own experience, to um, understand basically what went right, uh, my own survival. Mm -hmm. um, the most frequent question I was always asked was, how is it that you lived mm -hmm. when so many other people died mm -hmm. because you were all in the same place, the same time, mm -hmm. the same situation, some lived, some died. And I always had a fairly simple soundbite answer for that, mm -hmm. um, but I always knew that there was something much deeper mm -hmm. in, in inherent within my experience. And so uh, I wanted to, uh, to develop that and to, uh, and the only way I could do that was to think about it and write about it. Mm -hmm. And so I did. And uh, uh, at the time I, I was not motivated, even though the industry was really after me to publish mm. just sure. my story. Right because I was actually the highest on the mountain at the time when things oh, yeah. went wrong. Okay. And so they wanted to hear my story, but I was not motivated to, to publish at that point in time. I was motivated to write, but not mm -hmm. to publish. Mm -hmm. And it wasn't until after um, my wife Sandy got sick that, um, um, we spent a lot of alone time, a lot of quiet time, a lot of reflective time. Mm -hmm. And it was during that time, I think the most common theme that I can think of was gratitude, just gratitude for our life together, gratitude for God's gift of her love, and, and gratitude for her giving me the source of strength that I needed at critical moments on the mountain to save my life. Mm -hmm. and. And I finally decided that the best way for me to complete that sense of gratitude was to um, tell tell the story, uh, tell the tell the, sort of the untold story, not necessarily the big story that people internationally wanted to hear, but to tell the personal story about her role in in my survival, and it was more as a matter of. Uh, uh, honor and to pay tribute to her. It wasn't just me on that mountain. There were other people who were there with me and that it, how that experience in the end influenced what I, what I did and, and how I survived. I wanted very much to get that in print mm -hmm. while we were still together because she had never read the pages. Oh really? Wow. <clears throat> the pages that I had read and the way I had um, thought about my experience uh, and her role as what I call the voice of the heart. And so I was very anxious and I actually finished finally uh, in her hospital room, bad, yeah. you know, while she's in bed, yeah. finished writing the story. Well, as it turned out, she was never able to read it, but I was able to read it to her. Oh, good. And, uh, so it was, uh, it was uh, um, even though it came uh, 17 years uh, after uh, the event, mm -hmm. it came uh, at the right time and in the right moment and for the right reasons. I think if I had published uh, the story years earlier, it wouldn't have been the same story, it wouldn't mm -hmm. have been 
it wouldn't have meant as much uh, because it, and it wouldn't have touched on the depth of the, the personal story as, as much as it did. Uh, my life changed quite a bit in uh, 2010 when my wife was diagnosed with uh, serious illness and I uh, spent the next uh, six years as a full-time caregiver. And uh, what I call the paradox of times because it was the worst of times, mm. but it was also the best of times. Mm. Uh, I never felt more important in my whole life than I did uh, as, uh, as a caregiver. Mm. And uh, so she died 18 months ago. And again, that changed my life uh, because now I'm in a position to redefine my life uh, and, uh, and the struggles in doing that are, are not necessarily so easy mm -hmm. and uh, so uh, but it has now opened me up again to the things that I have done in the past. I was on a quest to climb the most sacred mountains in the world mm -hmm. and uh, so I'm because I'm still f fit and pretty capable of doing that kind of thing. I'm renewing that wow. uh, quest. Cool. And so that adds some excitement yeah. to my future.